and that you have here. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, Aspen Colloquium on uh, the Z, like the 187 scale model of Aspen Exploring. Fantastic title. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, David Chumaker, uh, who is a senior research scientist at MIT. Uh, he received his degree, two of them, PhDs from MIT, working on Kobe. And um, then he was uh, working uh, with uh, Levi's. Levi's was working on Kobe as well in those days. And later on, he went to Paris to do a second degree um, on interferometric techniques for gravitational waves. He back to MIT and he continued to work on gravitational wave detection for many years. Uh, most importantly, he was the leader in construction and issue of commissioning of the one model. See the massive success on the day one of the commission. So um, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society and American Association for Advanced Computer Science, and he has shared many of the prizes, such as Oscar, group, group of prizes for the detection of gravitational waves uh, uh, with the LIGO scientific collaboration. What is most relevant for today's topic is that he is the project manager for cosmic exploration. And for having us even his leadership at this point. And it's a pleasure to welcome you. In order to stay with him. Let's go. Thank you, Satya, for that generous introduction. Someone needs to get hold of the, um, the person who's running the AV to uh, click the button here. It's not my computer, it's the computer ah, behind. Yes. That requires, it, it's not a touch screen. Ah, a trackpad there. Navigation. Good. So, I'm, look, I'm delighted to be invited to, to give this colloquium. I'm delighted to be meeting with real humans in a real space. It's, it's really different, it's better. Um, this particular talk is one that's going to be about a mixture of LIGO and what we hope will be a, a, a significant uh, future uh, effort to make a, a 10 times better detector. Um, right behind that little TV screen, there's a thing that says NSF, and that's a very important bullet on this page. They've been an incredibly good support for this field. Um, bo both for us at the instrumental side, as well as for many of you who depend on it for, for support. Um, I work in LIGO. I stole a whole bunch of slides from uh, colleagues of mine, and I appreciate their support. Um, let's see if we can get this thing to advance. Yes, we can. So the roadmap for what I'm going to say today, I have a lot of words to say. Oh, and half of you know more about half of what I'm going to say than I do. And the other half of you may see that this is a kind of a strange way to spend an hour of your afternoon, but like, we'll, we'll live with that. I'm going to tell you a bit about gravitational wave properties, gravitational wave sources, present and future. Talk a bit about detector basics. This is where I start to get into where I have some more expertise, scaling for the future, and then some specifics about Cosmic Explorer. Try to keep my project manager uh, entity a little bit hidden. Um, oh, in 1915, um, our friend Albert Einstein uh, formulated the theory of general relativity, which is a basically different conception of how gravity works, not as a force, but attractive force between objects. Instead, that mass warps space-time, and space-time then causes masses to move. So it's a completely nonlinear, mixed-up thing. Where, um, space-time tells mass how to move, and mass tells space-time how to how, how to curve. Um, Part of his theory was a prediction that there would be gravitational waves. Um, his notion of gravitational wave generation was that the lowest order far field radiation would be a quadrupole. There are not two charges of gravitational mass. And this, it would take the form of a strain in space, H, which is proportional to a Newtonian gravitational wave constant, gravitational constant, the second derivative of the quadrupole moment. Um, distance between the source and the receptor, this absolutely terrible factor for, at least from the perspective of, of instrumentalists. Perfect example of a radiator are two masses in a circular orbit, which could be mimicked by two black holes or two neutron stars. At a distance r, the strain is then proportional to the mass. 
Uh, one over R is the drop off of amplitude with distance. And then there's a scaling factor for the frequency. Um, and a very important point is that this, this quadrupolar form is causing a stress in space time, which just pulls in one direction and squeezes in the other. And then that is reversed. And that's key to our ability to observe them. Um, about once a week, a wave passes with this characteristic strain. And that, those, those are the kinds of numbers that we'll be looking at today. It's um, a, a very small number to try to um, detect. See, it looks like I have to press on. How do I get this thing to advance now? A computer. There we go. It, it jumped a couple. Um, so here, here is a nice, um, nice um, mock-up of what but a collection of free particles would look like as a gravitational wave passes along the axis of this sea snake, sea, sea cucumber. And you can see it's, there's this characteristic squeezing and stretching of space drawn here as well. And the thing to get out of this page is the notion that the deviation from circular is proportional to the diameter of the circle or its radius, if you prefer. And that's going to be key to, again, to our ability to detect these things. A big L makes delta L easier to measure. Current detectors have about four kilometers for that length, three kilometers, four kilometers. And working out the numbers crudely, you get some 10 to the minus 18 meters, which you need to be sensitive if you want to see a passing gravitational wave. Let's see if this thing is going to be obedient. Yes, it is. Oh. Um, I'll distract you by having a simulation going um, in parallel here. On September 14th, 2015, um, two LIGO detectors were operating just a little bit before we intended to start our measurements. We were able to make the first direct observation of the time varying strain to gravitational waves. That's a fairly careful statement, and it's because I want to respect incredible science that Holson Taylor did looking at the um, decay in the orbit of the binary pulsar system. Um, they won the Nobel, and it was very well uh, merited. Um, what we saw were two black holes, 36 and 29 solar masses, merged some 1.3 billion uh, years ago, and so 1.3 billion light years away from the single black hole. If you do the math, you find there's about three solar masses that are missing that were radiated out as gravitational waves. And it was seen in the two LIGO detectors, separated by 3,000 kilometers, the time difference consistent with the speed of light. I think that were not simultaneous in the two detectors, but didn't take more than the time of travel of the speed of light between the two detectors, the two to arrive. The one other individual event that I'll call out is something that's near and dear to many of the people in this audience. Um, Virgo is a partner uh, with us in Italy. Uh, generally European, but mostly French and Italian instrument. And they joined our LIGO run in August of 2017. Just a couple of weeks later, it was possible to voir, to see in all three of these detectors on the earth, the signal from a single unified source, the delay that allowed us to triangulate back to the position of the source. It turned out that there was also a gamma ray, short gamma ray burst at that or less same moment, 1.7 seconds later. And that allowed a whole slew of really key observations to be made with this one detection. And I think it was a thing that had been a promise of multi-messenger astronomy using gravitational waves and electromagnetic for decades. And it was a realization of that. So far, it's the only one. We're looking forward to more. <coughs> oh, and now we actually, we can see the, um, Injection of a bunch of neutron rich material. A, a, in a couple of seconds, a jet is going to form that will uh, send out uh, particles uh, toward us at all and radio waves at all wavelengths. This is a kind of a fun graphic that summarizes what we've seen so far. This is solar mass. Um, this is an arbitrary, no, no, that's not a scale. And each one of these consists of two progenitor objects. A final, final object. These are uh, neutron stars. This could be a neutron star or a black hole. Most of these are black holes. It shows that we've already got a population, um, an, an exciting one. So all signals today are from coalescing binaries. Um, it's a little bit sad, but true. We hope to move beyond that. There was a recently completed gravitational wave transient catalog from all of the observations to date. 
Um, I had to note that it was a little bit like the whole Earth catalog, but it's the whole universe catalog so far. <laughs> How many of you remember the whole Earth catalog? Um, so that allowed a bunch of refined rate estimates from the first detections. I won't read these through, but you can see we have a, a nice small zoo of different kinds of combinations of, of coalescent binaries. It's also offered the best tests so far to general relativity in the strong field regime. It's the most extreme test at most, the greatest curvature to date. And, and again, either sadly or happily, all signals are consistent with general relativity so far. The sensitivity improvements boost the signal rate. That's something that we were able to see quite dramatically. Um, the volume of space that we can probe grows linearly with our sensitivity. And um, I'm sorry, the volume grows with the cube of our sensitivity. And that's shown here in this graph of the number of events that we've observed versus the days of observing. There are some calendar gaps in here that are more honestly here. You can see that from 01 to 02, we made some gradual increases in the sensitivity of the instruments moving from three to eight observations in sort of a year, year's time period. Moving from 02 to 03, we made a more significant change in the sensitivity and see a, a, quite a boost in the rate. And so we have encouragement to make further improvements. I wanted to say about this timeline here, there are some rather large gaps here between the ob observing periods and there's an even larger one until March of 2023 when we start the next one. So far, or improvements to sensitivity have caused the rate to go up so much that the total number of events that we see is greater than had we continued to observe with the precedent, detect, precedent, precedent detector. So far, it's, it's a winning deal if what you care about is quantity. We also a winning deal if what you care about is signal to noise ratio, because we're also increasing our resolution of, of waveforms that we look at. And let's get this thing to change. Ah, there we go. This is a map of what we currently are using as detectors. The ones which have actually participated in astrophysical detections are the two LIGO instruments and the Virgo instrument in Kashina, close to Pisa. Um, there's an instrument in Germany, which has served as a key prototype for a lot of the, of the ideas that are used in these other detectors. Agra is an underground cryogenic you know, sapphire optic system, which is still in just getting going. But is, is mapping out a future for some approaches to more sensitive detectors. And then LIGO India is underway in a sense that um, it's gotten a lot of approval, but hasn't gotten the final signatures yet. We made three of these detectors and there's one sitting in a can and waiting for an infrastructure in India to be ready. Late 2020s is um, what we hope. What could we do with a much better detector? Um, the greater sensitivity will enable a qualitative growth in the number of detections. If you say that the four is sort of a qualitative rather than quantitative difference, maybe it's stretching reality a bit. Increases the resolution of the waveforms. We'd be able to see a given waveform with 10 times better um, detail. And there will be a wider bandwidth option due to the multiple detectors that are involved. And that, that can be focused on this particularly interesting question of the neutron star coalescence. This, this, this nice science wheel was put together for the Cosmic Explorer study that was done for Cosmic Explorer. I'll read off some of the things, dynamics of dense matter. Um, we'll be able to look at the jets powering gamma ray bursts. The Nova and heavy nuclear synthesis can be a, a much more thoroughly um, investigated after this one event we've seen so far. And then ultimately we might be able to understand something about the phase structure of the, of the very bizarre material that makes up neutron stars. On the extreme gravity and fundamental physics front, um, I'm really hoping for surprises in terms of the objects that we see. I'm always disappointed when it's another coalescing binary. Um, we understand better the nature of strong gravity, and then maybe we can shed light, dark matter, and dark energy. It's unclear exactly what we'll learn there. Perhaps it will be primordial uh, black holes, for instance. And then in the last domain that's laid out here, um, the instruments that we're putting together will be able to see beyond the furthest um, um, star-like um, entities. And so we should be able to see black holes and neutron stars throughout cosmic time. Uh, let me turn the page to that. Um, but it's the best understood source. The fact that we have waveform models um, allows us to probe deeply into our noise structure and also infer a great deal of astrophysical information from the detailed waveforms. The instruments that we put together so far, here's a map of 
Um, we're, we're in the center of this, and this is redshift out heading further and further away. This is a couple of the sample um, um, detections that we've made. On this side of the donut, we're looking at black holes, 30 plus 30 solar mass black holes. And O3 could carve out about this much of the available universe. You can make incremental improvements to the instruments to get deeper into this population. But if you want to know what's beyond where we think they leave off, you want to build these more aggressive cosmic explorer or Einstein telescope instruments. For neutron stars, we're just getting started. We've seen about out to here. We think with our current instruments, we might be able to see a few more of these. But to really see the bulk of the population, we need these, these more exotic instruments. This is a different way of looking at it. Redshift versus source frame mass. We're currently in the sort of one to two Z if we're really lucky. Here you have significant to noise ratio out to tens of Z. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing to say you see them all. Sorry, what's meant by these dots? This is your guess as to the. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear. The, these dots, this is your guess as to the. It's, it's a Monte Carlo simulation of, of where there might be sources. Actually, the people who built it are out in the audience and they can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, how about that? Yes, good. So even better detectors would deliver more science. How do we build such a 10 times better detector? I wonder if I can ask the people running the AV to turn off the little snapshot of me in the corner. That's not doing a service to anybody. That blocks occasionally a bit of text. So I want to talk about the current detector concept, and then we'll move on into scaling laws. Well, the basic principle for detecting gravitational waves is something that well, it occurred to a number of different people. Now, unfortunately, we're not seeing my pretty picture of Ray Weiss back in the early 70s. He was mostly working on, on Kobe, but giving a course in general relativity and had to come up with some ideas. Um, the, the notion is to use a, a laser Michelson interferometer. I'm going to press a button and we'll watch a uh, little simulation take place here. Um, the notion is that you take a laser, split it into two with a beam splitter, you combine the beams, then look at the intensity on a photo detector at this point here as a measure of the strain in space. Now we're going to watch it in more gory detail, probably more detail than is interesting to most of the people <laughs> in this room. The notion is that you send out beams to these two arms to far mirrors. Um, you, you recombine the beams on a beam splitter and you compare the phases. And in phase will give a bright fringe, out of phase will give a dark fringe, destructive interference. And in that way, you become sensitive to differential motion of these two arms, which for a beam coming, a gravitational wave beam coming down into the table, it's exactly what you want to excite. And so it's a beautiful transducer from strain of any kind, but gravitational wave strain too, um, to an electrical signal from a photodiode that's sitting there. But we want to take a look now at what determines the sensitivity of this detector. Distance over which this strain is sensed is key. Resolution of the optical sensing is key. The stochastic forces that shake the mirrors and could mask the gravitational wave are also key. We're going to walk through each one of these. First thing I want to talk about is the infrastructure for a realistic implementation. Sufficient length of the arms is needed to bring the gravitational wave induced signal to a measurable level. Um, LIGO uses four kilometers. It looks like that's enough to at least start making some detections. A few meters would not do. The sensing laser must travel in an excellent vacuum. The molecule of gas passes the laser beam. Its polarizability makes a small shift in the, um, in the light beam. That's a, a noise source, another Poisson noise source. You have to have an excellent vacuum with 10 to the minus 9 tor for LIGO. The vacuum system diameter must accommodate a diffraction-limited beam or four kilometers. If you take one micron and calculate it out, um, you find that you're going to get something on the order of 10 centimeters in diameter of the beam. The tube has to be much larger than that to avoid scattered light effects. It leads to a 1.2 meter diameter, four kilometer long times two, eight kilometer long vacuum system or 10,000 cubic meters for a while, the biggest vacuum system, ultra high vacuum system. Vacuum system needs to be straight, may not follow the curvature of the earth needs to be level because of some cross coupling terms it needs to be protected from human and the natural environment and to do that it um, involved a fair amount of earth moving to get a straight surface concrete bed is laid down it's that concrete bed is aligned to seven millimeters over four kilometers using 
early versions of GPS back in the early 90s, 80s. And it's protected by a concrete cover, which in the US is used to block hunters' bullets. The corner and end buildings must be equipped with a, a particulate free environment, very good temperature control. There need to be staff buildings and outreach and public science buildings, that kind of thing. That leads to about 100,000 square feet of buildings. This is what you end up with in the case of LIGO. Um, it's the LIGO Hanford Observatory, LIGO Livingston Observatory. That's four kilometers from there to there. Um, this is a sort of a zoom underneath the cover of that building where you can see some of this um, vacuum system that's used to house the corner um, components. That's a big A-frame ladder, probably 15 feet tall to give you a sense of scale. Um, yeah. That's what it takes to make a system that can actually make a detection. Let's move on to the second um, point that I wanted to talk to, which is the resolution of the optical sensing. Shot noise is the ability to resolve the fringe shift to a gravitational wave. It's basically the, fl the fluctuations, the, the delta n over n of the photons or the electrons in the, in the electronic circuit, if you prefer. And it's Einstein who first pointed this out to us. And you could write a fairly simple formula for the, the sensitivity interpreted as a strain, this um, noise source, this limitation to sensing, goes as one over L, as, as always, big L is good. And then it goes as one over the square root of P. So you want a very large laser power, double the laser power, and you increase your sensitivity by a factor of 1.4. And th that's shown in this little graphic here, we'll be looking at a lot of these log scale, 10 hertz, 100 hertz, kilohertz, um, gravitational wave strain. I said you needed something like 10 to the minus 21. These are slightly different units because it's in a one hertz uh, bandwidth of noise, but this is the right kind of scale. And what you see here is, well, sketched an early version of LIGO and the improvement that we were able to make in this region of frequency up around a kilohertz, increasing the laser power and the efficiency of the optical system. On the other hand, there's radiation pressure noise. All those photons that you're sending at the mirror are actually physically moving the mirror by transferring momentum to it. And that um, could be written down in this form here. Again, one over L, which is good. One over MF squared, that's just the inertia of the mass expressing itself. M is the mass of, of, the, of this mirror. But now power of the laser appears in the numerator. And so that tends to increase the noise at low frequencies. You can see immediately that if you choose a frequency, you could choose an optimal power, and that's the standard quantum limit. Cool. This gives me a chance to show a photograph of one of those optics that, that we're talking about here, the 35, 34 centimeter um, optic, 40 kilograms. It's about as thick as it is big in diameter, uh, very high uh, quality uh, surface with just a few ppm of total loss. And um, that uh, you need a very efficient optical system. It also has low mechanical loss of the coating materials. It's like uh, Satya is chatting with, uh, with, with Zoom. And that, that, by the, that um, image, by the way, was taken inside one of the vacuum chambers. We're careful to take all the people out before we pump it out. <laughs> The optical schematic for O3, we've gone from a very simple Michelson interferometer of a laser beam splitter and two end mirrors to something which is rather more exotic. There are additional mirrors here, the input to the two cavities to increase the interaction time with the gravitational wave. There's a mirror here, which makes an impedance matching between the laser, the losses in the optical system. It allows by a resonance process to increase the amount of circulating power, more photons, less noise. Um, there's another partially transmissive mirror here, allows you to uh, selectively either extract or store gravitational wave signals to change um, the, the, the uh, frequency response of the system. There are additional cavities that are used to clean up the beams. It's a very complicated system. In particular, there are about 100 degrees of freedom to be controlled with servo control systems, lengths and angles. Do you, do you have a point uh, in your uh, thing? Can you point from that? That's what they're interested in. Because the camera is not following me well, I, that's unfortunate. I like walking around. I will turn on my laser pointer and I will be tied to this podium. So there we go. That's, a, that's okay. Um, now I have to try and find, okay, good. Oh, now let's move. We're discussing there 
sensing limits to how well we can determine what, where we are on the fringe. Now let's talk about the stochastic force, forces on the mirrors that can also mask the gravitational waves. So we, have, we suppress the physical transmission of motion from the outside. One normally thinks about seismic motion, but there are other sources as well, with three layers of six degree of freedom servo controlled platforms. Um, this allows us to reduce dramatically the motion at very low frequencies. We follow that with four pendulums in series. A pendulum, if you move it slowly, the suspension point slowly, of course, the mass follows. If you move it fast, the inertia of the mass tends to hold still. That's a characteristic function that falls off as one over F squared. If you put those in series, you actually get an isolation, which has a very stark, a sharp characteristic filter. There's also a more fundamental problem, which is Newtonian gravitational gradients to seismic activity. Seismic noise is, in fact, a compressional wave on the surface of the Earth that's running by at 10 to the 4 meters per second or so. And the greater density where that mass is being compressed exerts a stronger Newtonian gravitational pull on our test mass, and it moves a bit in that direction. Of course, that thing's moving along at some great speed. The result is that there's this constantly varying force vector, which is moving our test mass around, and not be shielded. If you go underground, as Kagra, the Japanese detector has, as Einstein telescope, the European companion cosmic explorer plans to do, you can reduce it somewhat. Um, and that provides, however, a lowest frequency that you can measure, as far as we understand ever, on ground-based gravitational wave detectors. So if you want to go to frequencies much below five hertz, maybe it's three hertz or something like that, you have to go to space and get away from the seismic motion. And of course, that's what Lisa, the laser interferometer space antenna is planning on doing. The thing we have to do is to concentrate thermal noise to frequency bands that limit their impact on gravitational waves. Talk a little bit about thermal noise. Um, there's KT of energy per mechanical mode of a system in, in equilibrium with a heat bath. Once again, Albert Einstein to the rescue here. Um, and for a simple harmonic oscillator, I think we're largely familiar with this, the RMS motion poses the square root of KT, Boltzmann's constant, over the Hooke's constant of the spring. It's, it's, it's an overall average motion of that object ex excitation due to the thermal heat bath. It's distributed in a frequency according to the loss as a function of frequency, real part of the impedance. And so you can see that if you change the loss, you can change how that motion is distributed. Here we are, we have an amplitude of motion, arbitrary scale, frequency log scale. The integral under this curve, any of these curves has got to be X, this XRMS, this KT. But if you make a very high Q system, you can gather that motion into a very narrow range, and try to place that, that narrow peak in a place that it doesn't disturb your observation of gravitational waves. We use that in a couple different ways. Um, here's one of our test masses. It's got this very clunky, chunky form. You push up its internal resonant frequencies to be above gravitational, uh, our gravitational wave band. This pendulum suspension, which is the last of the four in series that I showed you, is made of all few silica joined to few silica, um, no real joints there. It gives it a very, very high Q. In, in that case, we push this resonance to one hertz and are looking at depressing this uh, noise above the resonance. It's, it's a really neat way of trying to get around um, thermal noise without actually re re refrigerating anything. Curiously, the place where this hits us the most is in the mirror coatings. I show you once again this mirror. There's a couple hundred microns of amorphous material splattered onto here to form a high reflector at one micron. That's a rather lossy thing. The Q of that material is like 10 to the 4, and the Q of this substrate is like 10 to the 8th or so. so. This is where all the loss takes place. It's where all the thermal noise that we see is, is present and here in this model space, again, frequency versus strain amplitude, this is the line that represents the contribution from that coating. And it's the thing that's the dominant noise source, the place where our best sensitivity lies and which most, um, most directly um, controls our reach for, for gravitational wave events. Oh, that's it. The fluctuation dissipation theorem says, this is where the greatest motion is found, where the greatest losses are. And it is the dominant limit. Uh, here's a little formula that gives you a notion of how it scales um, it would get smaller if we can make the beam larger uh, beam larger on the mirrors, and that's a technique we can uh, try to work on. You want to reduce the dielectric loss to a minimum and uh, try to um, 
make the, the thickness as small as possible. It's a really complicated material science problem. It's limiting our ability to see gravitational waves. Well, not today because we're not observing today, but most recently. Um, this is another vision of the, um, well, I, got, I started talking to the screen again. My apologies to the remote audience. Um, this is a notion of the, um, well, this is a photograph of a completed um, suspension, the final state of the suspension, penultimate, and there are two above. This is that two degree, two times six degree of freedom um, internal uh, isolator with a third one outside. It's a close up of the uh, places where the fibers are joined to the test masses in a continuous sort of way. And to give you a sense of scale, here are two humans. I think this is Robert Schofield, University of Oregon. And this is, a, we, I showed you, I just showed you a photograph of Ray from the uh, early 70s. This is a photograph of Ray from the early 20s, a rather recent. So the lowest displacement noise to date is very, very messy plot. Again, frequency, here's 100 hertz. You could hear that on a good hi-fi. Um, and this is now, it's, this, is the, this is a displacement noise rather than a strain noise. You can get back to strain by dividing this by the arm length, four times 10 to the three meters. And you can see this is the kind of sensitivity we have. Um, there's the shot noise limited region, thermal noise limited region. This would be the radiation pressure noise limited region. We've got so much other technical noise there that that's what's dominating. This enabled indeed detections of gravitational waves. Cool. Let me say a little about squeezing. Um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle dictates that precise values of phase and amplitude cannot be known at the same time. Uh, delta X, delta Y has got to be less than H bar over two. I couldn't figure out how to make an H bar in PowerPoint. Um, but we, we, um, and, and we can identify these two parameters, these two, two variables with the phase and the amplitude of the light in this case. We can, however, choose to know the amplitude less well and look more closely at the phase. And squeezed light was used in 03 to, to make that sort of trade to, in fact, reduce, in some measure, this high frequency noise due to shot noise while increasing the contribution from radiation pressure, which in that instrument is still masked by other technical noise sources. For 04, this is the run that we're preparing for now, which will be ready in uh, September, I'm sorry, March of 2023, if things go well from now on forward, where you're introducing frequency dependent squeezing, which is really cool. I won't try to describe it in any great detail, except that we have an additional long cavity, optical cavity, and it acts as a low pass filter and like an RC filter, it rotates phase by 90 degrees between low frequencies and high frequencies. And in that way, you can trick up the squeezed light so that it reduces shot noise at high frequencies and reduces amplitude noise at low frequencies to get the best of both worlds. I wonder what Heisenberg would have thought of that. This is the projected sensitivity that we think we can achieve with this uh, souped up detector. O3 is the one that we've finished most recently, a couple of years ago now. And the projected O4 sensitivity is improved in shot noise region. We have somewhat better mirror coatings than we had before. And we have a reduction in both the um, the radiation pressure noise, which would be more important because we have higher circulating power, and also some optimism for our ability to reduce technical noise sources. But we've seen that ever better detectors would deliver more science. How to build such a 10 times better detector. We've been through the current concept, some limitations of sensitivity. Let's talk a bit about the scaling laws that are relevant. I always keep this little formula in mind, delta L is equal to H times L. So the noise due, due to stochastic forces is in general independent of arm length. There's a little bit of change in the coherence across the site of seismic noise once you get further apart than say a kilometer or so. The uh, similarly Newtonian background might be a little bit correlated for a short arm detector. Once you get to the kinds of lengths we're at, it's really basically unchanging with the distance between these masses. And truly unchanged is the thermal noise motion, magnetic electrostatic dynamic forces. Um, and then we just have to keep in mind that the change in optical path length for a given gravitational wave signal becomes larger. So the signal to noise ratio improves linearly with the length up to a point where you've got lambda over two of the gravitational wave within the arm length. And that turns out to be sort of 20 kilometers for two kilohertz, which is a, a magic number here. Um, advance, advance, there we go. Oh, the sensing noises, those are the stochastic forces. Now the sensing noises 
Um, it's, the, the models are a little bit more complicated and I won't try to talk you through them. I'm not sure I could. Um, the shot noise uh, scales pretty much as one over the square root of the arm length. Radiation pressure noise goes as uh, one over the cube, of the arm length, that's nice. Coating thermal noise gets better and better as you go to longer and longer arms. It makes a smaller and smaller contribution to the noise budget to speak more precisely. And then this residual gas noise facility limit it has a slightly complicated uh, structure. You're passing through more and more gas as you go to longer lengths. But at any rate, you don't suffer too much. So you can see making an interferometer longer works. So here's a more detailed um, uh, discussion of that graphically. Same frequency ranges, same strains here. Maybe we've moved down by another factor of 10 on the vertical scale. Advanced LIGO is sitting up here somewhere um, with the improvements that we think we can do on a four kilometer long baseline can make some incremental improvements. Really substantial improvement is made by making an instrument which is significantly longer than this model, both a 20 kilometer line and a 40 kilometer line is laid out. So that's basically what we want to do. And this is what our artist conception of it looks like. An undergraduate at Cal State Fullerton made this nice drawing. It gives you a sense of, of the majesty of this thing sitting out somewhere in, in the desert. Um, I want to say, again, the NSF has been a supporter of this endeavor, um, and they funded this Cosmic Explorer Horizon study, which is a both a look from the top down of science that you want to accomplish, and a look from the bottom up of what kinds of technologies are available and where you want to put effort. Um, take a look at CosmicExplorer.org if you want to see a copy of this and the other neat things. Um, it was also um, favorably mentioned in Astro 2020. We sent in some white papers not at all ready for a ranking, but it was clear that many of the arguments in the astrophysics decadal depended upon multi-messenger astrophysics. And one of the messengers that they're counting on are gravitational waves. And this is the way that we should get it when we look in the longer term. So it's the US contribution to the next generation network, we're calling it the XG network these days. Um, it's the LIGO-like concept for a single interferometer site on Earth's surface, not underground. Cosmic Explorer is a larger and more technically advanced version of LIGO. LIGO is a one-tenth scale model of Cosmic Explorer. And we have a baseline of two widely separated observatories of 40 kilometers and 20 kilometers in length. Um, what's the design of it like? Well, we're, let's move from LIGO forward. LIGO is currently installing the advanced LIGO A plus design, a room temperature, one micron light, fused silica, silica, fused silica optics, sputtered optical coatings, frequency dependent squeezed light, it's, it's the package. Um, we're starting to plan upgrades to the four kilometer detectors for the post-05 epoch. These are instruments that might start operating in 2029 or 2030 or something like that. And it looks like we can push some more performance out of the four kilometer instruments by being a bit more clever and refined in, in the current sort of design space. So the notion is that we take that design, make whatever changes are necessary, extend the baseline from four kilometers to 40 kilometers, you do with beam diameters and the masses of the objects and things like that, um, and thus take advantage of all the risk reduction that's been exercised in the LIGO environment. Not only the design activities, but then also the fact that the LIGO instruments would have run for years at this point with these designs as a way of knowing what works and what we want to refine further. It's relatively low risk on the instrumental front, um, and then we would, of course, retain the possibility to do anything more exotic that comes by. As early as the first instantiation would be welcome, but um, the, the system is intended to have a lifetime of 50 years and be sufficiently flexible to accommodate upgrades over a long period of time. Infrastructure, this is something like two thirds or three quarters of the cost of the whole system. So while it may seem a little bit uh, mundane, it's a place where we have to spend a great deal of our time and energy to do value engineering. So the baseline is 40 kilometers and 20 kilometer observatories. 20 kilometers is ideal for observing the two kilohertz end game of the neutron star mergers. I talked about uh, um, having an optimal length with respect to the gravitational wave wavelength. 20 kilometers places us in the best place to look more clo most closely at that magic moment. Three kilometers is op optimized for the maximum reach. Um, that's the thing that gets us out to the outside edges of that donut plot. Sites. Or, uh, CE are intended to be separated by a continental baseline, much like LIGO. 
we certainly hope that ET in Europe will be built. Um, I think that's coming along very well. And so it's very likely that it will. And certainly we will share data and be able to provide triangulation, low latency alerts and so forth and so on. The details to be worked out there. Uh, we're working on making less expensive vacuum systems. Um, LIGO used uh, stainless steel, we're thinking about using here ordinary uh, stuff that they used to ship oil around. There might be a lot of spare oil pipes around that time. Um, and then cleaning it up, coating the inside. Little detector for sight, as I mentioned. Um, I say that because um, Einstein Telescope is planning on a number of, of uh, interferometers running in parallel in parallel pipes. We intend to build this on the Earth's surface. Um, it's good because it's less expensive than tunneling. There's no complexity of doing the detector work underground. We've seen from Kagra just what a challenge it is to get down under the, under the ground, hard, hard uh, toed shoes, uh, well, all of the stuff that goes along with it, water, who knows what. Um, and so all, all that's good. It does, however, lead us to a more um, a larger input from the Newtonian background you would get if you were to go underground. You can get down some hundreds of meters below a fair amount of the seismic activity. And Einstein Telescope, as well as Kagra, um, is doing that. It, it, look at the, what Einstein Telescope thinks it will be able to achieve. And um, it crosses about the same level of sensitivity at five hertz the Einstein telescope does at seven hertz. And so that's the interval that you're using. It sounds very small. If you're looking at coalescing binaries, that would give you significantly more time to observe the Inspiral to say, give a feed forward to obser electromagnetic observers. It would be great if Einstein telescope builds that system and realizes that I think we're, we're, we will do well to stick with the surface construction. Last thing is you could ask about 40 kilometer sites. Geographically suitable sites are not difficult to find in the US. In fact, what you seek is what you would normally call a bowl. But when you map it onto the surface of a sphere, you're actually talking about something which is as flat as possible, it leads to the least, least of disturbance of the site. And that really is a very high goal for us. And I say that um, no matter where we build it, I'm gonna read this, no matter where we build the cosmic core, the history of the land will play a pivotal role in the project. All of the US, Canada as well, had people here before the colonials, colonists arrived. And we want to work with those people um, to understand how to integrate Cosmic Explorer into their lives. We want to feel like we're welcome on the soil where they live. We want them to be participants in identifying the sites, in helping us to prepare them, in helping us to build the instruments, then helping us to operate them. That's a challenge, but it's one which I think is exciting. Um, absolutely necessary to confront. Oh, status. Um, the conceptual design is now underway. Um, it's being done largely with volunteer labor. CE funding is being sought for this phase. Um, the NSF is enthusiastic about this, but they're still seeking the means to get their arms around a project that will ultimately grow the sort of $2 billion, which is the scale that we have for this full project. And so they're uh, inviting us to put in individual um, grant applications for various different aspects of the design. It's an awkward arrangement for a project like ours, but it's what the NSF is asking us to do. So we'll work with the NSF. We do have some international participation as well. Already certainly intellectual uh, contributions, which are of importance to us at, at, at this moment. But then also there could be a deeper commitments in the future. Project phase funding will be of the order, as I say, $2 billion. That's a pretty crude estimate. Um, and everybody who's an expert in this domain says, better multiply that by some factor. Some people say pi, some people, people say E, some people. Um, we certainly hope the NSF continues to see gravitational waves as a compelling topic. Um, we, we think that they do. That doesn't mean that they see a clear path to a $2 billion project would really it would eat up a lot of the free, free space in uh, NSF to do that. Love to have other kinds of funding. DOE would be one opportunity, some partnership there. Private funding is something which is in vogue. I think it's despicable, but if it's the way to get the funds to build the instrument, it's probably what we should do. And in-kind or other international support all sought. Um, I, what I should be, private funding. I think it's a real shame that the US government is not putting enough money into science funding for its citizens so that the citizens can use that as a resource, that shared set of, of, of resources to build the science for the future. If private funding is the right way to go, let's do it. 
project organization today has, has uh, got some, you have to have an org chart if you're a project. The important thing that, it, that I want to point out here is that there are a lot of institutions that are now involved. That's an extraordinarily important thing. You talk about a $2 billion project, you need to have support in all senses that's broad. Scientific support, the community support, indigenous people support, government support, and having a large number of institutions involved is one way to get at that. I want to zoom in to the um, central box here, the director's office. We, Matt Evans is our director. But I wanted to point out here, you, you, deputy directors, you'd expect to see somebody who's responsible for the instruments, and somebody responsible for the observational science. In addition, we wanted to elevate at that same level of priority our concerns of, of achieving equity, diversity, and inclusion, and then also set up this set of relationships with indigenous peoples. So that's, that's an important part of the project for us. Timeline, uh, you are here. We've completed this horizon study. We're now e working our way into this design phase. If things go well, we'd love to be selecting a site in the latter half of the, the 20s. We could hope for construction funding as early as the close of the 20s. If that could be realized, we don't think that it's impossible um, that we could get to a first lock around the mid 2030s. The way that's about when Einstein Telescope is hoping that it will be at that stage as well. And that would clearly be ideal for the science community. That's what we're going to strive to do. Oh, last page. Ground-based gravitational wave observation works. I think that's been well demonstrated. There are sometimes I've had to speak to audiences where that was not so broadly accepted. Um, there are lots of sources yet to be observed. That's quite evident. Scaling laws show the technical feasibility of better detectors. This US concept of the cosmic exposure was, de was developed in the NSF funded horizon study with top down observational science input and bottom up technology studies to, de to develop where we are with our current conceptual design. Biggest challenges, because we've choos chosen a low risk strategy from the technical standpoint, are finding the resources to build cosmic explorer. And there I really mean money um, to, to, to buy that pipe, lay down that concrete and, and build up those buildings. And then building the relationships with the host communities. We've seen very clearly in TMT can happen if you're not in a good relationship with the people who, who have a strong sense of the land. We're not gonna fool around with that. So my closing line is that the CE needs a very broad community support to merit its investment. Hope that all of you will think of this as something that might help enable some part of your science. And if you've got ideas of how to make it work better for you, make sure you get in touch with the team. There are a few of us around for the coming week or so, and we'll try to do what we can to clue you into what we think we can do and to look if there are things we should change to accommodate. There we go. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful talk and a great summary. We now open for questions. Yeah, please go ahead. How much of the future uh, would be improved by better numerical solutions? It's sort of the other half of the, of the problem. I think, yeah, let's see, I, thinking as an instrumentalist, I think one, one question would be, I, I don't really have an answer to that. One question would be, is there any chance that those improved um, simulations, waveforms, understanding from a numerical standpoint, would change the design that we want to build? The answer is, I think, relatively unlikely, um, although it could cause us to prioritize uh, uh, sensitivity over reach, um, something like that. I think it's perfectly obvious to take advantage of the high signal to noise ratios that we expect. That one will want ever better models that can be used to, to extract astrophysical inferences from the waveforms by having reliable models. So it's, it has to go hand in hand. Uh, I would have so welcome people on Zoom to raise their hand. Yeah, Alexandra. David, thanks for the awesome talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, are you worried in any way about the low frequency noise? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a thing that it, it, we make models after models for how we're going to make better detectors, and we always succeed at high frequencies and now are doing a very good job in the midband. It remains true that we have significant excesses over our modeled noise sources, even though our model noises include another 20 or 30 factors, we add them all up in the way that they should be added up. We still find that our noise is higher than that. We still have some theories for that, and they mostly revolve around scattered light effects, which are harder to characterize in detail. But I think 
that, that's a place where we'll, we should have a hard time convincing funding agencies we're credible. And I think the, the way to get at that, given the time scale for getting to the point of yes, no, for this kind of investment, is to continue to work on the current detectors and show that we can make progress there. Four is bringing a lot of new baffling in to reduce scattered light effects. We've already seen some incremental information that suggests to us that we're in a better situation than we were before there. So maybe we're making headroom on that. That that's that's a good question, and you shouldn't let experimentalists get away with sh shuffling it under the rug. You'll, you'll have to really speak up. I'm, I'm a little bit hard of hearing, and then the, the whole. I'll turn it down. Is this good? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about the trade-offs between building better suspension stages for isolation and actively controlling the seismic noise. Is it possible to have a sufficient grid of seismometers and models of compression in rock, et cetera, to control rather than filter? Good. Uh, let me give a couple of different answers to that. One is the actual seismic physically communicated motion from the outside to the, to the payload, I think um, it's always better to servo control to zero. Because for instance, if there's any scattered light from the optic, what you're doing is trying to subtract its physical motion, it will still be modulating the phase of light. Always better to do a better and better job of servoing there. But this other question is, it's also, your question also brings to light approaches that we can use to try and work on the Newtonian background, where no shielding is possible, no filtering, no servo controlling is possible. And you know, what are the things you can do there? You can build a moat, which causes a disconnect for the seismic waves. And so you, you know, a couple hundred meters away, you, you, you dig a, something which is too familiar to the people in Ukraine right now, um, and try to just block the seismic waves as they come across. Um, or you do put out a, a, a more and more detailed array of seismometers, build a very complex array of the material around, understand what the propagation is to your test mass, do a series of experiments. You probably set off little charges or hammer the ground or something like that, and then build an ever better model to suppress the, the Newtonian noise. The problem is that it's really steep. And if you could, you know, you get yourself a factor of 10 better, you move over by this, the, you know, the cube root or the fourth root or something of 10 in terms of the frequency. So it's, it's this question, you know, how much does five hertz to seven hertz matter to you? And I think probably not too far already from the point of diminishing returns there. Maybe some cleverer idea will come along on that front. Probably, uh, right here, yeah. I'm a biophysicist, so $2 billion is a lot. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot of money to me too, by the way. Several times you lamented the fact that, oh, we just saw another one of these mergers. That's all we seem to be seeing. So what's the chance you spend $2 million in 30 years and you see some more of those? It, it, I'm not the right person to answer that question in detail because I really am an instrument builder rather than an astrophysicist, almost as far away as you from the astrophysics. <laughs> but I, I think I tried to communicate that with the notion that you can do population studies by seeing 10 to the five instead of 10 uh, in ways that you just can't do otherwise. You, I think most exciting for me is the fact that you'll get a better resolution of the signal from a given source, and from that be able to be, make much more detailed inferences, as we were talking about before, of what's going in, on inside the astrophysics of, of these objects. And it also increases the probability of seeing weirdness, seeing things that you didn't expect or don't know how to explain. And so that's the most exciting thing to me. It's the hardest to motivate in terms of numbers. That's the most exciting part for me. I, I think, it, I mean, it's a really good question. And the, as we get better and better at instrument building and we see just how far we can push the four kilometer instruments, I think that gives an opportunity, I don't like the idea of delaying these next generation interferometers because we can learn so much from them and maybe learn something that would influence the design of the next phase. So it's, it's a continuum to figure out when you want to do that, it's a question of when there's going to be funding available, forth and so on, but it's, it's a perfectly responsible question. I think going for the past experience in astrophysics, we know that tremendous discoveries have been made every time in the factor of two improvement in such I gave you money before it was good, so I should I'll come to everyone. I'm coming. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so uh, I love your last point. I think that's incredibly important that you have broad community support. And then I also want to say, I think 
Molten messenger astronomy has shown that when you have gravitational waves with other uh, things like electromagnetic radiation, you, you get way more science than just you know the sum of the parts. And so I'm curious, what is the gravitational wave community, in particular, LIGO and uh, Cosmic Explorer, doing to reach out to these other communities, the EM community, the neutrino community? We're, we're, we're booking two weeks in Aspen. Um, that's, what, that's one action. Um, we're certainly uh, very aggressively involved in the DOE snowmass process and trying to, to, to get that whole astroparticle community more involved. I don't know, Satya or Salvo, if you want to see uh, some more things about the, the outreach and the direction of the astrophysics community. You can add, you have a very strong connection with the quantum measurement community. And while this is not, of course, directly an experiment that's targeted at that, LIGO has done some interesting stuff on that front. And I think that it, it's helping to push that field forward and hoping that some of those people think this is cool enough, to write it down someplace. Satya, anything you want to say? We are trying to do two things. One, internationally, we are trying to reach to other um, you know, nations that are interested in this. But within the uh, US, uh, in addition to the snow mass exercise, we would like people to help us within the Cosmic Explorer Consortium. The Winter Consortium it is not controlled by the project. It is a community which will value the aspirations of the community itself. So one way we are reaching out, but that's not the right word. I think the community would like to, if they would like to contribute, this is the forum in which that happens. Okay, uh, I think should say, anyone can join this consortium and as of now it does not come with any commitment on FT on your side. Yeah. So just if you want to participate or know more about what's happening, you can be a consortium member and you know, Anymore. But it's intended to be a path that could lead to a deeper commitment but as you identify things that are of interest to you. Yeah. Um, so you made the point that the, can you hear me? Just barely. <laughs> um, so you made the point that the size of the mirror is sort of limited by how much light scatters, right? So if for CE, then would that mean that the area of the mirror has to be an order of magnitude more than LIGO? And so the back the volume of the vacuum would then be two orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I, I think, I mean, I've, I've kind of heard what you said. Yes, the, the diameter of the tube is driven by, driven by, among other things, the scattering. You also want to have, I mean, I'll, I'll, on the technical side, you want to have a reasonable pumping speed so you don't have to have pumps every meter. You can spread the pumps more widely if you have a very large diameter, something that it has it's a cost advantage. Um, but I think that the key thing is, yes, we could have better and better mirrors that would have less and less scatter. You probably can't go down too much in volume from that sort of 1.2 meters. And it turns out that's actually a standard size for shipping oil and stuff around the world. Mm -hmm. So if we can use mild steel, not stainless steel, and use this sort of ordinary pipe that's used to, to, to ship uh, oil and pigs and who knows what around, and the, the, the cost of the um, actual steel this fabrication becomes actually quite manageable. It could be that if you go down by a factor to three quarters of the diameter, you're out of a norm for steel pipe size and you wouldn't be able to get much of an advantage. There's no good, I, we shouldn't have to go to a larger, uh, larger diameter. I'll note, by the way, I go is currently 1.2 meters in diameter. And it was because we were thinking about putting two beams side by side as we did for a little while actually in Hanford. And so it, it's oversized for a four kilometer instrument. For the 40 kilometer instrument, beam size grows by the square root of that. So it's a factor of three larger or something like that. Um, and so it's a, we're closer to marginal clearance for that tube. I'll also add inside that tube, there are baffles that are, catch the stray light. So the free um, aperture is more like a meter or so. Has that responded to your question? Okay, okay. Question here. Yeah, I wonder what the sense is of. Um, within the gravity wave uh, instrumentation community on approaches that are not actually the same as LIGO. But, um, so, you know, one thing that comes to mind is like, if I, what you try to measure is strain. So if I went to the ACE hardware, I'd buy a strain sensor and it doesn't use optics. You know, like a, a guitar strain is an excellent strain sensor. So, um, so are there are there approaches that kind of deviate from the optical approach? Well, of course, there was the early, effort and there's still some ongoing efforts to use resonant structures and yeah. their resonance could be excited 
And that could be read out either with an optical readout or maybe with a superconducting sensor, a squid or, or so. Those detectors have the problem that they concentrate their sensitivity in a very narrow resonance and can't do the sort of broadband spectral analysis that we want. So that's probably not promising. I think a thing that certainly has gotten a lot of attention, a fair amount of funding, using atom interferometry. You toss a couple atoms up, you let them propagate separately. One of them is influenced by the gravitational wave, the other one not, you bring them back together again, and you look at their relative phase. And there have been a lot of toy proposals, I'll call them, to build gravitational wave detectors based on that. And they're also, but now there are much more serious projects to try and realize very sensitive strain, strain meters based on atom interferometers. The current focus for the white papers I've seen is a really interesting frequency band. I said, on the ground, we can get down to about five hertz or so, and up to this two kilohertz magic number to see neutron stars. We're not looking higher up. There, and then LISA or other large scale interferometers that are currently planned, and China's got a couple in mind, come up to about a tenth of a hertz or so, or a hundredth of a hertz, and extend down almost to the to the you know the nano. Well, no, sorry, the microhertz region, the tens or hundreds of microhertz. But there's this band in the middle um, from say a tenth of a hertz to ten hertz or or thereabouts, which is really intriguing astrophysically. It could be a minimum in the um, as the astrophysical stochastic background, which you know, blocks other signals and might allow you to see a primordial gravitational wave background. It's the most exciting thing in the world. And so there's a lot of really interesting ideas about how to get at that instrumentally. And these atom interferometer folks think that that could be a good target for their technology. I don't know an awful lot about it. I think there were a couple of false starts where they made some promises or some, tried to sell something that they didn't know enough about. They may have been doing that 30 or 40 years ago, so maybe I shouldn't complain. But I think they're now starting to really get to proving that the systems could work. It'd be wonderful if they did. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I was thinking: Are there um, possible seriously negative environmental effects uh, uh, given by the building of cosmic explorer in the way you are using it? Right. And here you're talking about physical rather than sociological environmental effects, right? I mean, we 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 know already that it's something. That, the word earth moving is not a welcome one to indigenous communities. So, and so the, the, that's, that's where you start with that. But then it's actually, it's, we've been looking a little bit at decommissioning and in particular, um, LIGO has undergone a serious study of decommissioning uh, imposed by the NSF. And what we will be doing is very similar to that. It turns out that steel is, you can almost perfectly recycle um, given its pristine state. And then concrete is also something that you can largely reuse. And so that makes up the bulk of the materials. We don't have poisonous chemicals, radioactive materials, um, large volumes of lithium ion batteries, unless we start to st restore our own energy or something like that. So it's not intrinsically a very dirty thing. And you can actually recover most of it um, in terms of, of recycled materials. It's clearly the kind of thing that's going to get a higher and higher visibility, and it should, as we go forward. And so we'll have to have a good decommissioning plan that's credible when we actually put in a proposal. I think we're also thinking about recording or using uh, you know, uh, natural, not, not, not the carbon, carbon putting, trying to reduce the carbon product and using uh, the renewable energy sources. I think one last question that we take. Uh, yeah, a very just very quick on the your very interesting answer uh, to um, atomic interferometers. So that frequency range, you would then have to send these interferometers to space. The frequency range. This intermediate um, frequency range of okay. point one hertz. Yep. Range, then you would have to send those into space. Yes, so at least so far as my understanding goes, and I think it's the generally accepted understanding, we don't know a way to really knock the Newtonian gravitational gradient noise down below a couple hertz. And so it, it would just, it would, it would be easier to put it up into space. And of course that kind of thing is getting easier and less expensive with time um, as we go forward. Okay, um, I think we should thank David Schumacher again. Thank you for the discussion for my